Hi, I'm Ellen Munchauer. Welcome back to Johnny Benny Campus News. Easter break begins this Thursday. Both campuses will close at 8 p.m. and reopen at 9 a.m. on Monday, April 17th. Residents who will be staying on campus must have submitted a break stay request. This includes all international students, out-of-state students, and student athletes. There are only a few events this week with break coming up, including Edith Rylander and Larry Shug, Poetry in Place, happening in the Pottery Studio from 4 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday, April 12th. This event offers a unique opportunity to hear and converse with two central Minnesota poets that study their human and ecological communities. The reading and discussion will focus on their shared theme of attachment to place. Those who wish to attend are asked to RSVP. From 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. this Tuesday, April 11th, in Simons 136, join the McCarthy Center for a viewing and discussion of a TED Talk on college loans. Also on Tuesday is the Student Employee Appreciation Carnival, happening in Gretzky 204 from 2 to 5 p.m., sponsored by the Student Employment Leadership Team. This annual event is open to all students with campus jobs and has games, food, and drawings for prizes. All students that show their student ID at the door are entered in a drawing for a Samsung smartwatch. For FAE opportunities this week, the Percussion Ensemble will be performing at 7.30 p.m. on Monday, April 10th in the Escher Auditorium. Although there are only a few events on campus, there are plenty of Blazer and Johnny games happening this week. We go now to Austin Salmon to catch us up with this week's sports segment. Thanks, Alan. This week in Johnny Benny Sports, Johnny Baseball is coming off a four-game win streak after this past weekend's games. The Johnnies are set on continuing this win streak while facing Hamlin University on April 11th. The Blazers softball team is having a very impressive season thus far, sitting at a record of 19-5. The Blazers are also looking to continue their four-game win streak against Augsburg on Tuesday as well. At the time of this recording, the CSB tennis team is, has a 9-9 record and is now matching up against Carleton College. The SJU tennis team is also playing right now against rival St. Thomas. The men's track and field team will be traveling to St. Thomas this week in hopes of sweeping the meet. The women's track and field team will also be traveling away to face off against Hamlin University on April 12th. That's it for this week's JBCN Sports segment. I'm Austin Salmon. Back to you, Ellen. Thanks, Austin, and good luck to all our student athletes. Now for news off campus, we go to Maddie Morris, our political correspondent. Thanks, Ellen. Our major news story this week is the Senate vote on Judge Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. Last Thursday, the Senate triggered the so-called nuclear option that allowed Republicans to break a Democratic filibuster of the vote on Gorsuch. According to the New York Times, Republicans needed 60 votes, which meant at least eight Democrats and independents had to join their 52-seat majority to end debate on the nomination and proceed to a final vote. Only a handful of Democrats defected from this, and the vote failed, 55 to 45, leaving Republicans to choose between allowing the president's nominee to fail or triggering the nuclear option. Long-standing Senate tradition allows a minority of 41 senators to filibuster a Supreme Court nominee by blocking a final confirmation vote. Under the so-called nuclear option, a 51 majority could change the rules and abolish the filibuster completely. This move allows the GOP to push through an up-and-down vote to confirm Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. Now, Democrats are worried that by triggering this option, Republicans have made it much easier for President Trump to nominate a more conservative judge to the Supreme Court in the future if another seat becomes vacant. Some worry that the nuclear option will change the atmosphere of the Senate, from welcoming friendly debate to becoming more partisan. Republicans were quick to point out that Democrats themselves used this option in 2013 to obstruct Republican votes on the executive branch and lower court judges. Ultimately, the Senate voted 55-45 late Thursday morning to cut off debate, four votes more than needed under the new rules, and they moved to a final vote on Judge Gorsuch's confirmation Friday evening, with a simple majority needed for approval. That's all we have for this week. Check back next time for your political update. This is Maddie Morris reporting for Johnny Benny Campus News. Back to you, Ellen. Thanks, Maddie. We look forward to hearing more on that developing story. And finally, to wrap up this week's episode, we go to Nicole Schultz with Headline News. Thanks, Ellen. Welcome back to JBCN's segment called Headline News, bringing you the top news stories from this week to help you stay up to date during your busy school week. First, Last Monday, there was a deadly attack in St. Petersburg Metro. Authorities say the attack was carried out by a suicide bomber originally from the Central Asia Republic of Kyrgyzstan. 
The Russian investigative committee said the bomber was a 22-year-old Russian national born in Kyrgyzstan. The committee reports that the investigator matched his DNA to a bomb left at the second metro station that was defused by authorities. The Russian health ministry on Tuesday raised the number of dead from 11 to 14. It was unclear whether the number included the attacker. Four of the injured are in critical condition according to the Russian health minister. In more global news, at least 70 people have been killed in a suspected chemical attack in a rebel-held town in northwestern Syria. Hundreds suffered symptoms consistent with reaction to nerve agent after what the opposition and Western powers said was a Syrian government airstrike on the area last Tuesday morning. The Syrian military denied using any chemical agent, while its ally Russia said an airstrike hit a rebel depot full of chemical munitions. In local news, April marks Distractive Driving Awareness Month and multiple law enforcement agencies are hitting the streets this month in effort to combat the rising problem. In part to eliminate enforcement and confusion, there is a hands-free bill that moved through the legislation aiming to ban all cell phones behind the wheel for everything, even phone calls. The legislation has a hearing before a committee, but no other action on this measure is scheduled. The sponsor of this bill says he will try again in the next session. The fine for distracted driving right now in Minnesota is $225. Join us next week for headline news to keep you up to date with your top news stories. This was Nicole Schultz reporting for Johnny Benny Campus News. Back to you, Ellen. Thanks, Nicole. That's all for today's show. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ellen Munchauer reporting for Johnny Benny Campus News. Enjoy your break and make sure to tune in next time.